And I should say the Christian presence in India began 2,000 years ago with the Apostle Thomas, uh, who is described in the New Testament as one of the disciples of Jesus. And according to traditions, after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, Thomas went to South India and he started churches there. These are called the Martoma churches, the churches started by Thomas. You go to, um, to South India and there's this mountain which they refer to as uh, Thomas's mountain. And you go up on that mountain and you see the place where he was martyred for his faith as he preached the gospel to the Brahman priests. And so India has had a 2,000 year history of various kinds of engagements with the Christian church, and especially so in modern times. For today, churches are across India. Um, now, <clears throat> as the church movement began to spread across South India and, 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 and India as a whole, there was a number of reform movements within Hinduism that began to take root, you see. If you say, as we read a minute ago, that every action is Brahman, that doesn't encourage reformation because whether your actions are cruel or kind, they're equally Brahman. But with the beginnings of interaction with the Christian movement within India, and particularly the teachings of Jesus, and especially the Sermon on the Mount, we do find a number of reform movements developing in the last century, in fact, way back into the 19th century, which, uh, which, which uh, rather significantly transformed Hinduism. I think especially of Ram Mahan Roy. Ram Mahan Roy. He was a friend of the first Protestant missionary to India called William Carey. William Carey and Ram Mahan Roy became friends. And as I mentioned earlier, Carey was very concerned about um, some, of the, uh, some of the practices in Hinduism, especially related to widow suicide. That gave him great concern. And this Ramahan Roy joined hands, he was a Hindu, but he joined hands with William Carey in struggling to bring about a transformation in India where this practice of widow, of widow suicide would be no more. It was a long process. It took many years till finally the laws were passed and the practices instituted which prohibited widow suicide. It didn't just happen right away. But Ramahan Roy was very clear that his inspiration for his commitment to transformations, to reforms within Hinduism, was rooted in the teachings of Jesus, particularly the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he, he believed that Jesus is a jewel that Hinduism desperately needs as it reaches for reformations and transformations that were necessary for healthy participation in the modern world. So he is one voice. We could spend a lot of time looking at these reforms, reformers, but the, you should just be aware that that is one dimension of the Christian engagement with Hinduism um, over, over the years. Um, another very significant uh, philosopher uh, within, within the Hindu experience was Radhakrishnan. <clears throat> was Radhakrishnan. Uh, he wrote prolifically. When I was in university working on my doctoral program, Ramahan Roy was uh, still very active in his writings and so forth. And in, in the university classrooms uh, where I was studying in the United States, the voice of Ramahan Roy was, uh, was heard with, uh, with uh, much appreciation in helping the Western world understand the essence of Hinduism and gifts that he believed Hinduism can offer to the Western world. Radhakrishnan not only interpreted Hinduism for the Western world, he also brought into the conversation um, Christian understandings of the reality of nature and of history. Remember, we said that within Hinduism, history and nature are considered as maya, as an illusion. Radhakrishnan pushed back on that quite hard in his discussions with the Hindu philosophers and people, arguing that real progress and real history can happen even within a Hindu context. 
In other words, he was calling for a revolution, I would say, in the Hindu understanding of the nature of history and of, and, and of creation of nature, saying even though Hinduism would say it is Maya, in reality there is a, phenomenon, a phenomenal world and a historical world that we must take very seriously. Now where did he get such ideas? Well, my judgment is that he got them from the Bible, because in the Bible history is real, it's going in a direction, and creation is real and is to be developed. So real progress in our real world is very possible and right within biblical understanding. I think he was very much influenced by those biblical themes as he pushed Hinduism to a more uh, sympathetic understanding and commitment to the real world in which we live. This was calling for a revolution. So Radha Krishnan not only influenced the Western world in an understanding of Hinduism, but he also pressed very energetically to have Hindus have a revolution in their understanding of the meaning of history and the meaning of creation. His theory was rooted in, the Bra in, in, in Brahmanistic philosophy, which says that <laughs> Brahman is the source of all religion. If all is Brahman, then all religion gets its source from Brahman. That was the heart of his teaching. Since all is Brahman, then every religion in the world is really a reflection of Brahman. And this is how he explained it in his books. The bottom line, as I said, is all is Brahman. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Therefore, he says, you have some very high religions, and you have religions that are lower, but all of them drawing their source from the same place, Brahmanism, Brahman. So some people, they need gods. They're polytheists. Polytheists. These are the people you see flocking to the Hindu temples by the millions, you know, worshiping the god of their choice. Well, if all this Brahman, why should you choose any god? <laughs> you worship anything. Worship a tree if you want to. Why must you go to a temple? Well, he says some people have a spirituality that needs the assistance of divinities. And so you go to worship these gods who are like a, a, uh, a window into the universal Brahman. This, this philosophy is called Ahimsa. Ahimsa, the preservation of life. It's a philosophy which uh, has produced certainly vegetarianism. Uh, a lot of Hindus, and particularly Jains, would be vegetarian, for they would not want to eat any form of animal life that has been killed for food. That would be anathema. It would not be accepted within this Jain kind of philosophy. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, who was the spiritual and political leader leading India to independence from the British Empire, back in the 1940s uh, and earlier. Why, uh, he was very much influenced by this Jain philosophy of nonviolence against all forms of life. And so his nonviolent resistance, his nonviolent approach to resistance against the British Empire was very grounded in Jain philosophy. That wasn't the only source. That wasn't the only source of his commitment to nonviolence, but it was a significant source of his commitment to nonviolence, this commitment to taking no life whatsoever.